All right, Marriage Prep 101, getting ready for the big day. Lesson number eight in the series, The Four A's of a Successful Marriage. This is part two. So in our last session, we focused on the idea that no matter what country or culture or belief system, everybody wants a happy marriage, everybody. Even people who don't believe in God, they want a happy marriage too. We, mo we noted rather that this is not only what people wanted, they expected that entering into marriage would automatically bring them happiness. People believe that if I get married, that will automatically bring me into happiness. Of course, if you look at the statistics on divorce, almost one in two marriages between people who have no religious convictions or practices, one in two their rate of divorce. The main point that I was trying to make uh, last week was that marriage by design, by design, marriages have to improve from where they begin in order to succeed and produce happiness. The original reason and goal that most people have when they decide to get married in the first place is to be happy, but a lot of them don't realize that that happiness comes if you work <laughs> at your marriage, if you work at improving your marriage. Remember I said that everybody starts with a full tank of happiness gasoline. You know, you're off and running, you know, for the tank is full. And so it's, it's wonderful. Uh, the, the problem is uh, many uh, people think that they can ride for a lifetime on that original tank of happiness gasoline, and you can't. You have to keep filling the tank, okay? And this is what this lesson and some of these lessons are really about, how to, how to keep filling the tank. So that brings us to the subject of this lesson today where I'd like to share with you the four A's necessary to cultivate in order to have a successful, happy marriage that everyone hopes to have. Now I call this lesson the four A's of a successful marriage because in order to succeed at a marital relationship, there's some very specific things that both partners need to do to improve it. I mean, there are a lot of things you can do, but there are specific things that absolutely have to be done. If you want to, I'll keep with my original imagery there, if you want to fill that tank with happiness gas. These four things all begin with the letter A. So they can be easily remembered. So there are four A's. The first A, agape. Agape, which is the Bible word for love. Well, let me say that a better way. Which is the word the Bible uses to describe love. Not just feelings or emotions like, you, like in soap operas, but the kind of love necessary to produce successful marriages. Again, what the Bible calls agape love that is adapted to the marriage relationship. Definition of agape, a disciplined commitment towards the well-being of another person. A disciplined commitment towards the well-being of another person. That's agape type love. In this case, we're talking about our marriage partner. So let's analyze this kind of love just from the definition, a commitment, a conscious choice to commit ourselves to another person permanently. When you say I do, that's, that's what you're doing. I'm making this commitment. I'm committing myself to you, just to you. When each partner knows that this is the basis of the relationship, they are then free to be themselves to show their weaknesses, to be completely truthful without the fear that the other will run off at the first sign of trouble. What constitutes marriage in every society is the commitment, not the sex act. It's the commitment that constitutes marriage. Otherwise we'd be married to every person that we ever had sex with. What makes you married is the fact that you've committed yourself to live as husband or wife, not just the idea that you've moved in together. Another factor in this kind of love, a disciplined commitment. 
Discipline, self-control is necessary if we're to realize the goals of our commitment. It's necessary in order to overcome sexual temptation that occurs in every marriage. I heard a young guy once say to me, boy, it's great, I'm getting married and that'll be great. I'll never have to look at another woman again. You know? <laughs> sure. Discipline is necessary to be kind, to be patient, to be forgiving. It takes discipline to be able to do those kind of things. Because your flesh and your anger and whatever may want to do a whole lot of the other things. Your feelings may be getting away from you and perhaps what you want to do is to strike back or to get revenge or to feel sorry for yourself or whatever in various situations that occur in a marriage. It requires discipline to maintain kindness when you're in a volatile situation. It takes discipline to be patient, to at least make an effort to be forgiving. You know, I don't, you know, in my own life, you know, I've, I've had this prayer on my mind many times. Lord, I don't feel very forgiving at the moment. At the moment, I just want to get back. I just want revenge at the moment. But with your help, I'm going to work my way to forgiveness, but I'm not there yet. Not today anyways. It takes discipline to stay on that road, you know, to keep working yourself towards that. So love needs discipline in order to stay focused. Another part of the analysis. A disciplined commitment to the well-being. The main objective of marriage is not to acquire a house or to pay off the house or to have a car. It's not even to raise children or to please our parents. The main objective is the well-being of our partner. Uh, our children know, and I've said it in front of them many times at home and in class, I would say to them when they were younger, especially when they were teenagers, old enough to understand the, the sense of what I was saying, I'd say to them, your mother was there before you guys came along and your mother's going to be there after you guys are gone. She's my number one priority. When this is the objective, these other activities, acquiring a house and property and raising the kids and doing all of that, all those things fall into, they kind of fall into place. It's easy to say that in a classroom, you know, this setting, but when the kids are running around and they've got 150 demands a minute, it's hard to remember that my number one priority is my, is my partner. A lot of women, because so much time is demanded of them by their children, forget that they do have a priority, which is their partner. And the other way around, men getting busy, if, they're, you know, if, if it's a, a type of uh, situation where the, uh, where the wife is raising a family at home, let's just say, and he's the primary earner, well, he's busy. You know, he's busy earning a living to support his family, thinking, I'm doing what I'm doing. My, my, you know, I hear this all the time. Well, my job's to earn the money and your job's to raise the kids. No. My job is the discipline, well, you know, the, the well-being of you, Lise. And your job is a discipline, well, you know, discipline focus on, on me. That's our number one job. And those other things serve that. That's if you want a lifetime uh, marriage. So a disciplined commitment towards the well-being of our partners, that's what creates love in marriage. Without this kind of love, marriages can't succeed. They can last, but they don't succeed. I've met a lot of people who've been married 40 years, but they're not happy. There's a big difference between making your marriage last and having a happy marriage. So the objective is to succeed and be happy in marriage, not just make it last 50 years. With agape type love, marriage is never long enough. 
There's never enough time to be with your beloved partner. And you see that in you know, elderly couples where one is, is critically ill, perhaps near death, and the other, you, know, you talk to the other person, they've had a happy marriage, you know, and they've been married 63 years or something, and they say, it's not enough, I don't want you to go. You know, they've had agape in their marriage. So the first day, is agape, second, second A. Another thing we need to work on to create happiness in marriage, attraction. By attraction, I do mean sexual attraction. A good sex life, when health and circumstances permit, is a sign and a necessity for happiness and success in, in, in marriage. I mean, God created sex for the pleasure and comfort of the married couple and for procreation. That means that even after we've finished having our children, there still remains a divine reason for sex. Genesis one and, and two. So sex is a, you know, it's a powerful force and when it is expressed in marriage, it becomes an act of love and faith, an act of, an act of deeper commitment between the partners. So something that is just a drive or a driving force outside of marriage becomes a precious and creative force within marriage. I mean, we know how destructive sex outside of marriage can, can be. From this act, children are born, and that is a sign from heaven that sex is good because life comes from it. That's a good thing. Now the trick, of course, is how to maintain that attraction within marriage over a period of time. That's <laughs> That's the problem. Three ways I can suggest. Believe God when He tells you that the pleasure that comes from sex is good. You'd be amazed at how many people think that sex is just something you have to kind of tolerate or you do it, but it's not really a good thing. They were naked and they were not ashamed, the Bible says. So many people have poor sex because they feel guilty or unspiritual in sexual relationships with their own spouse. <laughs> no reason for that. And, and who are the worst? Church people. <laughs> Church people. You, you raise them from an early age you know, and, and, and say to them, you know, no sex out of marriage, no sex out of marriage. You don't give them any other information then that's wrong, you never do that. You, know, you don't talk to them, you don't, you don't you know, give them the whole picture about what sex is all about. They grew up thinking, well, it's, it's wrong, I shouldn't do that. And then all of a sudden, one day, out of the blue, they say, I do, and the thing that was wrong all their life is now right. <laughs> no wonder uh, there's this confusion with a lot of religious people when it comes to sex. So we need to believe God when He says, hey, within marriage, sex is a good thing. We also have to make the other person's well-being our major objective within our marriage, especially within our sex life. Sexual feelings are stimulated by kindness and faithfulness and tenderness and generosity and humility and other giving virtues. When we work on these things first, then physical contact is desirable. I mean, who wants physical contact with a selfish, rude, impatient person, even if they have a nice body? Jesus says that impure sex and adultery begins in the heart, right? Well, that is also true of legitimate sex within marriage. It also begins in the heart. You know this, you know, the, the main sex organ is the brain. And of course, believe, be generous, be available. I mean, there's nothing more encouraging or desirable than a willing partner. Not just willing to have sex, but willing to please. Psychologists have discovered that a man's sex drive actually goes down when he feels assured that his wife is willing to please him. 
Imagine that. You know, women are always afraid that there'll be no end if they just give in every time. Oh, if I give in every time, well, here's, you know, I mean, we're having sex five times a day, this guy. <laughs> but psychologists say that when a man is less anxious about this, his needs tend to balance out at a lower level. When this happens, women are less nervous. They can relax more and usually end up having a greater desire more often themselves. Now, God knew this principle from the start and Paul's teaching reflects this idea in 1 Corinthians chapter seven. He says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife. The duty he's talking about here is not taking out the trash or fixing her car. The duty here is to satisfy her sexually. So the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife. This is 2,000 years ago. This is an apostle of the Lord saying the wife has sexual needs. The husband's duty is to make sure he knows and fulfills those sexual needs. And then he says, notice he starts with the husband's duty, not the wife. And then he says, likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Authority for what? Well, authority for sexual satisfaction, that authority. You know, a man is responsible to please and satisfy his wife's sexual needs, whatever they are, and vice versa. You know, here's the rub, right? Here's the rub. We can't always be equally disposed. In other words, we don't always feel like it at the same time. Isn't that the bug? Wouldn't it be great if we could just program, you know, okay, I'm program, okay, I'm dialing it in. How about uh, 10.15? No, 10.15, I, th- I gotta take a call tonight. At t- how about 11.15? 11, 11, Good, 11.15, okay, I got it in there. You know, and we could just program our 11.15, bing! You know, and it's all good. Well, we know, those of, you know, we know it doesn't work like that. And we know that because of that, because we're not always in the mood at the same time for a thousand different reasons, this is what causes the tension. But that tension can be used for good if we are always disposed to please our partner. In other words, I may not always feel like having sex, but I always want to please you. Boy, that's an attitude I can live with. I can live with no or not right now or I'm just not there. You know, I can live with that if I'm assured that my partner is really devoted to pleasing me. So when we say no, we're saying that you can't have what is yours. So we maintain sexual attraction in marriage by realizing that God is pleased when we give ourselves to our partner without restrictions or negotiations. Boy, I can do a whole lesson on that one. The bartering for sex, you know? If you do this, you get that. If you do that, you get this. Mm. Very bad. Moves ahead your personal emotional agenda, but it's a killer on your marriage, I'll tell you that much. And maintaining sexual attraction helps build a successful marriage. A tricky thing, a difficult thing, surely you know, I've, I've spent five, six minutes on it, that doesn't do it justice, but uh, recognize that uh, sex is important. And it's not the teacher that says so, the Lord says so. God is pleased when married people have great sex. It means they're having a great relationship. Third A is appreciation. Agape, attraction, appreciation. The greatest weakness in men is their lack of appreciation in what being a woman and a wife and a mother is all about. Of course, I believe women suffer from the same lack of appreciation about men. The difference is that women think they know men 
because they know what men want. But most women fail to understand the difference between what men are and what men want. Those are not the same thing. Those are not the same thing. By appreciation, I don't mean thank you cards for gifts or flowers on Mother's Day. I don't mean thanking each other to pass the salt, thank you. No, I don't mean that. By appreciation, I mean understanding what each other's roles and responsibilities are and what that does to you. For example, in Christian homes, the Bible teaches us that men and women have different roles. In Ephesians 5, to 24, Paul tells us that men are to be the head of their wives and women are to be in submission to their husbands. Submission, you know, the military term to, be, to, to place oneself under, okay. Well, a marriage succeeds when the husband works at being the head of the woman with her cooperation. And the wife works at submitting to her husband with the same understanding and cooperation. A woman needs to understand the responsibility and pressure that a man is under to fulfill his role or the anxiety at the thought that he's not fulfilling his role. I'm not earning enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not good enough father. I should have seen that. I'm, I'm supposed to be the leader here and I, did, I, I didn't see that thing coming at all or I didn't react well to that. Sometimes women don't understand that those thoughts are going through men's minds all the time. She also needs to help him fulfill his role as leader because not all men are natural leaders. You know, a woman's big mistake is that they take over instead of helping him develop and grow into the leadership role. In other words, he's not leading properly. She says, okay, just get out of the way. Just let me, you know, I can do this. You know, just you know, you relax over there. I'll take over. Going to get her done. Attitude. Again, that gets it done, but it doesn't help the marriage. Remember, we're talking about how to have a happy marriage. Men's mistake is that they cop out and they let women do it. They let the women take on the burden of leadership because it makes it easier for them. Not good. Now the reverse is true for women. Men need to understand how hard it is to assume the submissive position because it is not a natural one and society ridicules women who do. You're in submission to your husband? Really? Wow, what century do you come from? When we appreciate, and by appreciate I mean understand, the challenges faced by our partner in fulfilling their God-given roles in marriage, we develop the respect for one another that builds the admiration and loyalty and empathy so necessary to create a successful marriage and the happiness that comes from this success. My wife could run the show. She has the ability, the intelligence, the education, you know, but she has helped me be the leader of our family, the spiritual and moral leader of our family. Of course, in wisdom, I've understood uh, that uh, she makes up a very important part of the decision-making process. Let's talk about this. What do you think? I, I, I've learned the hard way that going ahead without getting her counsel has not always worked out real well. <laughs> But in the end, she says, hey, that's what I, what I think, you know, but we have a deal, her and I, we have a deal in our marriage. If we, if we talk about something and I say, okay, well, all right, let's go left or let's go left instead of right, you know what I'm saying, one of those decisions. We have a deal. If the thing goes sour, there's no comeback after that. There's no, well, I told you, you know, I thought, you know, when we were talking about it, I, you know, I, I kind of expressed a little bit of hesitation. You know, there's none of that. If we say, you know, we're going to buy the house, let's just say, you know, we're going to buy that house. Okay, you sure? Well, okay, if you think, you know, I, I, really, I think we can do it, you know, we'll buy that house. And then all of a sudden, two years later, you know, something happens, whatever, you know, we find out there are termites eating the house from under us or something, you know, should have contacted the real estate agent uh, first. 
There is no, oh, oh nice, good, yeah. Mr. I want this house over here. Now it's going to cost us $20,000 to have the termites. You know, rem There's none of that because we have a deal together. We have a deal together. Once we decide good or bad, we take the consequences together. And then the fourth A is aid. To create marriages, agape, attraction, appreciation, and aid. If no one ever sinned, every marriage would be successful. However, because we are weak and subject to fall, we need to go to God and go to Him often to find help. Help to understand each other, help to raise our children, help to manage our money, help to strengthen us through sickness and sin and all of the trials that we go through in marriage. You know, in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5, Paul encourages couples who are having trouble to go to God for help in prayer. You know, many people would rather live in misery than ask for help. That's called pride. Sometimes we need to ask our partner for help. Men are usually the ones more guilty of this than women. I got it. They confuse the role of leader. You know, they think that that means they have to decide everything by themselves or they have to bear everything alone. They won't go to their wife, not for her opinion, for her help. I need you. I need you to pray for me. I need you to help me with this because I can't bear it alone to carry this sorrow I have or to carry this grief that I have, or to carry this temptation that I'm having, whatever it is. Sometimes we need to ask our partner for help, real help in dealing with physical and emotional and spiritual problems. Do you know, do you know how close that brings you to another person when you acknowledge true weakness, needing their help, being that vulnerable in front of them? I mean, that, that's, that's cement, that cements you together in a relationship. Sometimes the couple together needs outside help to get through a tough moment. I mean, there's you know, farm aid and flood aid, disaster aid. Sometimes we need marriage aid. Sometimes you have to talk to a brother in the Lord or a family member, maybe the minister, a counselor, whatever. Christian couples need to care enough about their relationships that they're going to seek help when they're in trouble. I remember when I was in college <clears throat> and we were taking classes you know, on psychology and counseling, stuff like that, and I asked the professor, I said, okay, when, when, you know, when, when is the moment that a couple you know, should ask for outside help? And um, he said to me, you know, as a couple, you know that you need outside help when you no longer are able to cope and resolve the situation by yourselves. When together as a couple, you still can't manage to overcome the thing or resolve the thing, or you, know, you just can't manage to work on it yourself, that's when you need to bring in, you know. the Bible says you know, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. So it's wise to reach out to the right person or the right situation to get the help that you need for your couple. The successful marriage isn't too proud to ask for help, and you know you need help, as I say, when you cannot make each other happy anymore. When you're saying things, to you, I don't know, man, there's, not, I can't, there's nothing I can do to make him happy. There's nothing I can say to make her happy. When you're saying things like that, you need help. And what help do you need? Well, you need help in order to figure out how to make your partner happy. You've lost the ability or the other person has lost the willingness to receive. And that sometimes required a third person. A third person who can look at your couple objectively, no emotion, you know, they've got no skin in the game. A third person who only wants you to be happy and, and healthy as a, as a couple. That's their only objective. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list, 
But we've reviewed four important things we need to work at constantly if we want better marriages. Again, we have 30 minutes. Agape, our purpose in marriage is the well-being of the other. That's the number one priority in marriage, not our hobbies, not even our kids. Because they're going to grow up and they're going to go off and they're going to find pa partners and, and we're going to be you know, with each other still. So you know, you've got about 20 odd years, 20, 25 years out of a 50 year marriage, let's just say. You know, half of the marriage, okay, you're busy raising the kids and they're gone. Oh, they visit and they come and this and that. But in the end, you know, it's your marriage. If you think your children are the source of your happiness, yeah, they're not the source of your happiness. They bring happiness and joy, absolutely. But in marriage, the source of happiness is each other. Remember, that's why you got married. I love her, she makes me happy. I want to do anything to make her happy. We're going to be together so that we can be happy together. You know, remember that? That's still what's happening you know, 20, 30, 40 years later. As I've said in, a, in another lesson, the wonderful thing is that God has put in every season of a marriage you know, certain blessings that make the marriage worthwhile in every season. So there are some things that Lisa and I enjoy together now after 40 years of marriage that I, I didn't even think were things <laughs> 40 years ago. I could not have even imagined things like this 40 years ago. So Christian marriage is a marvelous thing because God shows us the way and blesses us in every stage if we stick at it. Attraction, giving our bodies to each other. No restrictions. Within respect, of course, with respect. Appreciation, helping the other person do their job. I'll help you lead. I'll help you with the kids. I'll help you with your job. I'll help you with the house. I'll help you with the money. You know, in our house, Lisa's the one that, she's, she's the banker, she takes care of that stuff. <laughs> she didn't like the way I balanced my, my checkbook when we first got married. You know, for me, at the end of the month, if it was off four, six dollars, who cares? You know, I round it off. You know. It's not important. And she was aghast. <laughs> I didn't care. 20 more, 20 less in the long run. You know. So she says, hey, let me, let, me, let me just take care of that for you. you know, sure, okay. You know. And uh, she's done a great job. 40 years, every bill has been paid on time, never been late for anything. We know exactly what, well, she knows, I, I don't. Heaven forbid she should pass away before I do because uh, <laughs> I'd have to hire a forensic accountant to, <laughs> to figure it all out. You know, but, but that's marriage, right? That's, that's how it works in marriage. Appreciate, I appreciate that about her. I don't ridicule her for that. I appreciate the fact that she is uh, precise, very precise in those matters. And then aid, of course, not too proud to ask for help from each other and then together to ask for help outside our marriage. Next to, next to uh, the grace that we have in Jesus Christ, the most precious favor God gives to mankind is a loving partner. And I pray, of course, that everyone here will enjoy better marriages filled with uh, happiness. Now, for those of you who are married, uh, there's a little uh, marriage builder exercise to do with your spouse that's on the lesson note. So if you wanna, if you wanna do that at home, the only, uh, the only uh, suggestion that I make is make sure you, you know, by appointment, make sure the kids are in bed and you've turned off the phone and because the marriage builder exercise will get you talking and it'll get you, you know, discussing and, and into it and you don't want to be disturbed uh, you know, by a phone call or whatever. Just give yourself an hour to do that, um, that little exercise. I think that'll, uh, uh, that'll help you uh, internalize some of the things that we've talked about here today. All right, that's our lesson. Thank you very much for your attention.